Welcome to the Raising Smart Kids podcast. I'm your host, Yang Pratt, and each week we'll explore ways in which the arts can help you raise a smarter kid. I'll be sharing ways the arts can propel your child's learning and interviewing top artists, educators, and entrepreneurs. These guests will share why the arts are so very important to your child, along with actionable ideas you can easily implement into your already busy schedule. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast here on iTunes and share us with a friend. For extra tips on raising smart kids, head on over to artsmartparenting.com and click on the live tab. Our guest on today's podcast is Amy Scholl Rasmussen. Amy knew at a very young age that she wanted to share her love of music with others. At the age of 15, she began teaching piano lessons to children in her northern Utah neighborhood. Amy attended the University of Utah as a piano performance major. She began teaching piano at Bravo Arts Academy in 2001 and has never left. During her years at Bravo, she has worked closely with owner Angie Ford. Since joining Bravo, Amy has seen the business grow from an in-home piano studio to now having three commercial locations. Amy oversees faculty members who teach classes for music, dance, preschool, tumbling, karate, art, and kindergarten. She works closely with Bravo's managers and teachers to ensure the education students are receiving is improving their skills and providing a positive learning environment. Amy loves the chance to accompany musicians for church and civic events. She also volunteers to play the piano at the local hospital. She believes every child should have the opportunity to receive the benefits of an arts-based education. Amy, I'm so glad to have you on the show today. Thank you for inviting me. I'm excited to be here. Let's talk about your journey into the arts and how the arts has shaped who you've become. Great. So as a young child, I think I was about six is when I first was interested in music and I asked my mom if I could join the church choir And at age six, that wasn't probably the most appropriate thing. And so she said, well, let's try piano first. And so we did that. And I grew up with a mom who had a very musical background. And she was great at helping me to know the importance of practice and the importance of daily practice and helping hold me accountable. Um, When I was probably about in sixth grade or so is when I began to enjoy practicing more and not just do it because my mom Mm -hmm. wanted me to. (laughs) Um, And probably about age 14 is when I I knew I wanted to be a teacher and I knew that I I loved to play the piano and I that pursue in life. And do you think that piano is probably the easiest instrument for a young child to begin with? I heard a quote once that I'm not going to be able to say perfectly, but it was something to the effect of piano is the easiest instrument to learn, but the hardest to master. And I think that's very true because as a piano teacher that's taught a lot of beginning students, I know that I can teach them how to play Mary Had a Little Lamb and, (laughs) and we can go. And so I think it's a great instrument for the beginner, um, student. I also think piano teaches a lot of things that anyone that wants to learn an instrument, it is a good foundation. Um, Piano, you can also start at a younger age than say, you know, guitar or a brass instrument or drums because there's not as many um, gross motor skills and finger strength for pressing the strings that's needed. So it's a great um, introduction if you have a young child that is wanting to play an instrument and the teacher says, oh, I don't take, you know, a guitar student until they're eight, start with piano. And that way they can learn the foundation, um, the foundation skills that are needed for all music as far as note reading and rhythm. And it, it is a great instrument to start on, but I, I would say that it, it can get very complex at the end. So 
Well, absolutely. When you think about some of the, the world's most foremost composers, um, Beethoven, Mozart come to mind right off the top of my head. And I mean, if you, if you just open the score and look at the complexity of what is there, I mean, it just makes my mind boggle that they were able to create these and visualize them and put them on paper for us to enjoy centuries later. Yeah. And I think one thing I love about the piano is that it, it ha can have a very full sound and it can also sound very orchestral, even though it's just a single instrument. You know, you can hear different parts of the orchestra. Uh, if you're listening to a Beethoven sonata and you're familiar with his symphonies, a lot of the time I can be like, okay, this kind of sounds like the string section and this is more like the woodwinds. And, and that's one thing I love about piano is there's a lot of different sounds that it can make and it's fun. Yeah, and the kids at our school who take piano get such joy out of it. And it's interesting because in our world today where everything is so fast-paced and kids want the instant gratification, I feel learning a musical instrument provides just that. That if you hit the wrong key or the wrong note, you can immediately hear and get that feedback, which is really important to propel the learning to the next step. Yes, I agree. With so many activities for kids to choose from these days, why is it important for them to participate in the arts? I think that it helps them um, just become more well-rounded and just learn things that they might not learn in school. I also, one thing I love about the arts, no matter if it's music or dance um, or art, like drawing and painting, is it relates to so much history as far as um, the composers in the past and, and artists and, and the music of the past for dance, um, ballet especially. And I think it, it helps them just appreciate artists that were in the past and learn about them. I also think that it helps as far as skills with, with learning in school as accomplishing goals um, learning to work in small chunks and and accomplish something bigger. I think it is it's just a great thing for all for all people to learn, whether they're kids or or big people, adults. Yeah, and, and there's lots of schools that teach music and dance in different communities, um, but I do feel like you hit on earlier that bringing the kids back to the history and the timeline and the evolution of whether it's modern dance or whether it's music has such a profound effect on the appreciation they take away at the end of the day. Yes, I, I think it helps create a connection to the art that they're learning. It helps them um, just connect things with the the past as well. I mean, you know, when you're in school, you learn about these things. You learn about, you know, World War II, but if you learn about a composer or, you know, a dance um, artist that was alive at that time, it just it helps them to connect to the dots a little bit, I think. I think so too. And I think that being able to understand, you know, the history, the history that you learn in school and then learning the supplemental things about composers or choreographers does a lot to fill in the gaps for kids because I feel like if we can give them tools to make their learning and understand a subject at a deeper level and have it be more relatable to them, it definitely will have longer lasting impact. Yes. So how do you go about incorporating the history of the art in classes at Bravo? Um, for me personally, as a teacher, I, I like to talk about um, the time period that the music piece was written in and talk about the things that the kids might know about that time period. Um, I also think that kids love interesting facts, um, <laughs> like Beethoven lost his hearing and cut off the legs of his piano. You know, they always just think that is very funny and it helps them um, remember Beethoven. <laughs> I, I also um, like to tell the story of the piece if I, you know, there's a lot of times there's a lot of imagery in, in music and I find that that helps connect to the, 
the composer, if you talk about this is what um, the piece sounds like and this is what he was learning at this time. I just had a piano student that learned the Raindrop Prelude by Chopin and we kind of talked about Chopin's life and how it was, um, he kind of had a hard life and we talked about, you know, what does this prelude sound like? What is this repeating note? You know, this sensation that's throughout the whole piece. And I, I hope that's something that he'll remember for a long time. Um, and remember, you know, about Chopin and, you know, just different things like that. And I think that's tremendous too. And, and really being able to, put all these pieces together for each student to have them understand at a deeper level what it is they're studying, whether it's Chopin or Beethoven. And, you know, um, last month we had a, a music history lesson all about Beethoven. So I love that you talked about him because our students got to learn a little bit more about his life and his struggles. And I think that really goes a long way in helping them to understand that this person who did amazing things in his life had some struggles and challenges and he found a way to overcome them. So that's a huge springboard for parents then to take home and say, look, tell me about your challenges. How are we going to make a plan to overcome them? So again, one of the other great lessons to be learned from the arts. Yeah, I love that. So you talked earlier about you learned how to be a good goal setter and to accomplish your goals and chunk things down. What are What's another valuable lesson you've learned from participating in music and the arts in general? Uh, one thing that I, I learned is that when you're learning a new skill is that it can kind of be like a little roller coaster that there's times that, you know, you're going up in excitement of the roller coaster and it's very fun to be learning, but then sometimes it gets boring or something gets hard and you just struggle. I remember in as a piano student myself, learning um, to play hands together was one of those struggles. It's just something that students, you know, can really have a hard time with. But then once you get it through, like you keep, you go up the roller coaster again, and then it's getting exciting. And so it just kind of, um, that there's waves in life, that sometimes in life it is just, everything is, you know, feeling really well and going good and you're able to feel like things are moving along but then sometimes it goes down but I think just realizing that you always go back up is um is an important thing that I've learned from just studying different aspects of the arts and that's such a great lesson to learn because that's how life is in general. So if we can translate that analogy into each little section of what we're learning and understand that there are going to be ups and there are going to be downs, and we have to learn to be flexible and adapt to changes that may happen to help get us to that next goal marker. Yes, I agree. So how can the arts help build a child's self-confidence? I think that can come through um, performances, uh, for sure. I and I think as a teacher and as a teacher, it's our our job to make sure the student is prepared for performances, but also the parents are able to help them prepare as well. And so we need to be able to give parents the the education that they need to help prepare their child. But I think through successful performances, um you know, students hear from mom and dad and grandma and grandpa how well they did. And I think it just keeps motivating them to continue and and move forward. And I that is one of the most rewarding things as a performer and as a teacher and also as a parent. Yeah, and I like to refer to that notion as the sparkle, right? You get to see the sparkle when things connect and they're so proud of what they've done. And you know that has to go with them in school, in their other activities, and just in their family to really help bolster them and, and, and really just know that what they've done is something to be very proud of. Yeah. Yes. And I love hearing about how students, um, you know, have shown off a new skill, whether it's 
and you know they learned their back back handspring and they showed grandma and grandpa and grandma and grandpa just ood and odd I think that is just something that helps a child just feel so excited and it just helps them to continue along the path to to learn more skills yeah and that self-confidence really goes with them throughout their whole life and it's interesting because I feel like sometimes in our society because it's so busy and so focused on media and instant gratification it's easy for kids to feel badly about themselves by comparing themselves to their rock stars or whoever's on the cover of time magazine or whatever magazine they happen to read there's just that notion or that desire to achieve that when that's not necessarily a good thing for them so if we're able to at a young age build those little steps of self-confidence and get them to understand that what they know and who they are is good enough and they are contributing immense value to the world. That's a really big lesson for these kids to learn. Yeah, and you're right. It does stay with them for a very long time, which is wonderful. Absolutely. We couldn't ask for more, right? Yes. (laughs) So I know over the years you have worked for thousands of students. Are there any students' stories that really just stick out to you in terms of, you know, coming to the arts was transformative for them? At Bravo, there was a student who I was not the teacher, but I was able to watch his musical journey. And from what what I know about the family, um, he kind of came from a a difficult background. Um, Mom was just only a single mom and grandma was paying for lessons. And he really stuck with it from when he was a young age through a teenager and he was able um, to just learn a lot of skills and, and just continue. And he was a very good practicer, which, which helped a lot. And I remember hearing um, when he was a little, probably 15 or 16, I would say, Um, there was a volunteer group that he was asked to um, accompany for. And he was just so excited and just, you could just see the joy in his eyes that someone, you know, recognized his hard work and it was very rewarding to him. And it was just, you know, a moment that I remember and, and that's something that I, I think will stick with him. Like you were talking about, I'm just, you know, remember like, hey, I, I learned this and I was able to accomplish this and I was asked to help with with this project. And I, that's one thing that sticks out to me. Excellent. Yeah, and I know there's probably hundreds of stories like that. I know I had a student probably in my early years of teaching and I remember when she first came to class, she was just little and she carried this blanket with her. And her mom said, you know, if she... Does it, you know, if she gets overwhelmed or if she's not really feeling like she wants to participate, she's going to be under this blanket and just be invisible. So this went on for weeks and weeks and weeks, and, and every week she was under the blanket less and less and less. And now I look at her, and, and her mom still sends me messages and says, you know, this is because of the time we spent in our classes with her that she's so confident. I mean, she's up there performing in front of thousands of people now. There's no hesitation, no qualms about that. But it all started with the blanket in the classroom. And so these are the stories that just, you know, warm my heart and make me so grateful that I get to do this every day. Yeah, there, there are a lot of stories, which I think as an educator, you are blessed to see that journey of kids learn and, and progress. That best feeling ever. Yes. <laughs> All right. We're just about to the end of our time together, Amy. But if parents have questions for you or about what you do at Bravo, what is the best way for them to connect with you? Uh, the best way to connect is on Bravo's web- website, which is utahbravo.com. And then to click on contact us and just complete that form and and just they will be able to get that to me. Fantastic. And I'll make sure that I put that link directly in the show notes page for the podcast so they can just click directly to you and connect with you there. Great. 
Before we say our goodbyes today, is there one parting piece of advice that you have for parents listening? I think it would be to not be afraid to ask the teacher for advice. Um, Parent involvement is key in any part of your child's life. And and teachers, I, they try to help as much as they can, but at the end of the day, we're not mind readers. So if there's something that you're struggling with at home with the child as far as practicing or, or they just are fighting with something, don't be afraid to talk with the teacher um, you know, when the student's not there and just say, hey, can you tell me more about this? I know as a teacher, I always appreciate that. And and I'm happy to give as many ideas as I can and, and just share because as a teacher and a parent and the child, we're all on a team together and we all want the same goal at the end of the day. We want the child to learn and be successful and have fun. I couldn't agree more. And really going back to the triad we have set up with the teacher, the parent, and the child, and making it a community effort. It's not one person driving harder than the rest. We're all coming to the middle to create the best possible experience for everyone involved. Yes, I definitely agree with that. Excellent. Well, Amy, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show today. I so appreciate it. Yes, thank you. And we'll talk to you soon. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks for tuning in to the Raising Smart Kids podcast. If you're enjoying this podcast, please share us with a friend and head on over to iTunes and leave us a review there and let us know you're enjoying the show. If you're looking for more tips on raising smart kids, head to Amazon.com and pick up a copy of my first book, Raising a Superhero. How to Unleash Your Child's Eight Superpowers and Propel Learning Through the Arts. Thanks for allowing me to be your guide on this parenting adventure, and I look forward to catching you next time.